nature program, and it, the, uh, a program about apes came on, and so they were seeing how the apes were acting, and, the, and we were eating from a we were eating from a plate, and he said, like he was looking at the apes, and he was re he reminding himself of the the nobility and the dignity that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us over other animals. You see, most other animals. Horses, sheep, they put their face into the food. For us, we bring the food up to us with our hands. Now granted, there are some animals that do that. Anybody ever seen raccoons, how they eat? They'll actually get their food, they got their little hands, and they'll wash it in the creek and eat their food. They can open up doors, you know. So there's always exceptions to the rules, but that was one of the tafsirs that Ibn Abbas gave to this ayah. But there's many other ways that Allah has ennobled us with. And one of them is the uh, just that, that feeling of independence. And so, when we, when we deal with ourselves, or we deal with other people around us, especially those entrusted, Allah has entrusted us to, to, to care for them, our children, our students, and we're helping to raise them up, we have to recognize their independent choice and, 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 and encourage that. Of course, within, within reason, you know, keeping them away from the harm and the haram, those two things, the harm and the haram. Just remove one A, haram and harm keeping them away from those two things, but giving them enough autonomy. It's almost like semi-autonomous governments. You know, we're, we have to give them some, some autonomy <clears throat> because the human being by their nature, they want to make their decisions on their own. Um, and one of the, the poets said, When nafsu in du'iyat bil unfi abiya wa hiya ma umirat bil rifqi ta'tamiru The nafs, the self. And this goes for whether you're dealing with other people and first and foremost when you're dealing with yourself. The human self, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has created the, the, the nafs, is that as long as you encourage it with gentleness, it will obey. But if you try to force it, the natural reaction will be, no, I don't want to do that. And just think about any, any experience you have yourself. If somebody tries to tell you to do something, your, your first reaction is no. I'm gonna, you know, you can't tell me what to do. Even if you know that that might be beneficial. How many times have we had somebody give us advice? But it's some of that unsolicited advice that comes in a very uh, condescending manner. Oh, you shouldn't be eating that. You know, and maybe you know, okay, yeah, I shouldn't be eating this, but you don't have a right to tell me. Like, that's gonna be my decision. That's the feeling. Uh, that, that we have. So we have to recognize that about ourselves. So if we're training our souls, we can't crush the souls all at once. We can't force ourselves to do something. We have to go incrementally. And that's the definition of tarbiyah. The definition of tarbiyah is that you, uh, you give people things incrementally at their stage of development. And like one of my, one of my shiuk said, he said, it's just like the way a bird raises its, its, um, its, its offspring. At first, it sits on the, the eggs. <clears throat> then once they come out, it gives them semi-digested food, right? The bird will go and pick up um, whatever food it's going to be eat, digest it, or have it semi-digested, regurgitate it, give it to the, to the birds. Then once they get a little bit older, they give them fully uh, or you know undigested food, and they get them moving around the nest, and they get them to the, up to the edge, and they kind of push them out to the branch, and incrementally push them, push them away. So that's tarbiyah. Now, whether we're doing tarbiyah of our own selves, we have to recognize that we have to give ourselves room to grow, and especially if we're, we have uh, our children, our nieces, our nephews, those in the community, um, and our children. <clears throat> so one of, the, one, one of the things that I wanted to do with this halaqa to also complement what's going on with the, the, the boys and the young men's halaqa is to actually follow a curriculum. So last year during the, during the halaqa, um, I was following topics, but not a specific book. So what I wanted to do is go over, during this year of halaqas, we're meeting each Friday, is go over a series of just two books by one scholar from West Africa, his name is Sheikh Mohammed Mouloud. And I'll tell you a little bit about this Sheikh and about the topics that he chose. The Sheikh is from about 150 years ago in Mauritania, in West Africa. And he comes from a long line of scholars. Seven of his grandparents were qadis. They were each judges. When it came to him, and people expected him now as a scholar who had memorized the Quran as a young child, studied the deen, knew all of the, the various subjects of, of Islam. He knew tafsir of the Quran. He knew memorization of the Quran. He knew the Arabic language, grammar, uh, nahu, sarf, morphology, lugha, the language, balagha, 
rhetoric, all of the languages, all of the sciences of the Quran. He knew the science of, of Arabic, sorry, also of Hadith, also of Fiqh, of Aqidah, of Tazkiyah, of all of the, the, the logic and, and, and theology. He had studied all of those. Now he's ready to be a judge. He said, I don't want to have this connection. That's too, that's too much involvement with people and it's too much connection to the dunya. I want to uh, just teach and be with people. And what he said is that he actually wanted to be with people with as few sins as possible. So when he would drink tea, he would only drink tea with children. He said, adults have sins and I want to be around the people who don't have sins. So that's another thing to, that we should remember when we see children because as parents, uh, as teachers, if we get too much into the mode of um, you know, the authority figure, the adab giver, the, the tarbiyah, we forget that these are human beings that actually have no sin on their soul. Like they're very close, their state, their spiritual state, they're very close to malaika, the angels in that sense, because the angels have no sin, and these children have no sin. Now they might do crazy stuff, and they might make choices that if they were an adult, we would say that's haram, but for them in their right, it's not haram. They're not accruing any sin. So in that state, they're actually very, very spiritual. So it's also a good reminder to us, like when children make dua, that's something we should want for ourselves. So if you have any family members, you know, and you're asking people to make dua, ask the children in your family to make dua for you, because those are people who have no sins on their souls. And this is something that even the Arabs in Jahiliyyah recognized when they wanted to reach out to Allah. Because the Arabs, they were mushrikeen, they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Didn't the Arabs believe in Allah? Did they say there is no such thing as Allah? The Jahiliya Arabs. That wasn't their kufr. What was their kufr? Shirk. They were associating partners with Allah. And when, is, when the Prophet ﷺ came and told them not to commit the shirk, what was their excuse? What's that? Well, that's one excuse. Our forefathers were doing it. But what was their logical excuse? They say, hey, hold on a second. We believe in Allah. And we have these other idols, but there's not a problem because what? What do they do? What's that? It makes us closer. It makes us closer. It's just like these are just intermediaries between us and Allah. It's kind of like how in the, the Catholic faith uh, they have all these saints, right? The saint uh, of this and the saint of war and the saint of uh, St. Patrick drove all the snakes out of Ireland, supposedly. And so some people turn, turn to St. Uh, Patrick or whoever it might be. Or in other faiths they might have the god of this and the god of that. Or the Greeks have, well, they don't actually have one main god of them. Well, Zeus, I guess, right? So then all of these other gods, so if you want to go, if you want, if you need love in your life, you go to the God of love. And if you need war, you go to the God of war. And so the Arabs did the same thing too. They said, we're just trying to get closer to Allah by going through these other intermediaries. Uh, but they believed in Allah. Now that's shirk, of course, it's kufr. It's not acceptable. <clears throat> but they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they knew how, uh, they had an understanding that if we need to, present, or if we want to have somebody present something to Allah, we go to the most sacred. So one of the things they used to do is they would take children with them to the Kaaba and hold the children up in the Kaaba and say, Ya Allah, send us the rains. Or whatever dua it was that they were making because they recognized the children have no sins. Um, so getting back to Sheikh Muhammad Maudud, he wanted to be with, with people who were not involved in the dunya. Um, when uh, uh, and then he began, uh, in addition to teaching, he began writing books. But the choices of the books that he made was almost a, a social critique of what was being done and what was not being done Islamically in terms of education. So he looked at all of the, the various subjects that were being taught. And one of the things that he noticed is he said, some of the people who, who study Islam and teach Islam, they're getting too caught up in subjects that don't occur too much. And he gave examples in one of his books that we'll go through, inshallah. So they're very, one is about 80 lines of poetry, the other is about 120. Throughout this year of, of Harata, uh, I, I intend to get through it, and I'm also going over it with the, the young men and the boys in the Harata. So if you have children there, you'll kind of know one of, or some of the, what we're sharing with them. One of the things he said is that people are studying the, the ahkam, the rules of um, collateral, putting up collateral. So one of the things in, in the Sharia, and this is something the Prophet ﷺ taught us, is that you can take a debt and you put something up for collateral. So the closest thing would be like a pawn shop. Everybody knows how a pawn shop works? You go in there to borrow money, 
you put something up as collateral, a camera, a microphone, uh, a, a phone, and you say, I'm going to borrow $200. If I don't pay you back in such and such time, you get to keep the phone. Now, this is something the Prophet ﷺ actually codified in the Sharia and gave us rules on how to conduct that transaction, that business transaction, and how not to. So, pawn shops are not Sharia compliant. No, I don't want people to go back and say, oh, you know, Sharia uh, financing. No. Uh, there's a number of issues with that. But, uh, and to show you that even he himself engaged in what's called rahim in Arabic. Rahanun, rahim. Uh, when he passed away, he had almost no wealth except what? If you're familiar with the Shama'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi. Hmm? He had some armor that was marhunun in the Yahudi. There was a Jewish man in Medina and the Prophet ﷺ had borrowed money from him and put up as collateral his armor. Now this teaches us a lot. One, I mean there's many, many benefits we can get just from understanding this. One, think about this. The Prophet ﷺ, when he needed money, he worked for it or he borrowed it and he paid it back. Now think of, think of people who take on religious roles in our society and they expect the society to support them. Rather than go, and I'm not talking about a specific like a job. I'm just saying somebody said, look, I'm a, I'm a pious, righteous Muslim, and people should give me gifts because I don't need to work. Yet the Prophet ﷺ, he either worked for his money and he taught us about how important it was to uh, work from whatever your hands create. To the point that one time, Salman al Farisi, when he was the governor, baskets and selling them. And they said, why are you weaving baskets? You're the governor of Iraq. You're getting a stipend from Beit al-Man, from the treasury. He said, that, that stipend that I get, I give away in Sadaqah, because I, 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 don't, I don't want that money. Because the Prophet Sallallahu the person I love, taught me that the best thing I can eat is that which my own hand created. And so he used to weave the baskets, sell them, and that's what he supported himself and his family. So this is the work ethic that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, taught, uh, taught us and um, if he needed wealth, if it, if it was, he put something up. He didn't go and expect somebody to give him sadaqah. In fact, for him and his family, he forbade uh, consuming sadaqah. In any case, the Prophet Sallallahu passed away in his armor. It also tells us like what was his wealth. He had very little wealth. One of the things he had was armor. And in those days, it was quite expensive to have a shield, of, you know, to have chainmail armor or plate armor. But that's one of... Uh, what, what he owed. And if, you, if you're not familiar with the Shama'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi, um, it's translated sometimes as the, the, um, the description of the Prophet There's various translations. It's been translated a couple of times into English. It's also been translated into Urdu. Uh, Sheikh Zakari al-Kandahlawi has a, uh, uh, a commentary on it in Urdu that's also been translated into English. You can find it online. If you look it up, just say Shama'il, S-H-A-M-A-I-L. Tirmidhi. Imam Tirmidhi collected all of the descriptions of the Prophet The way his hair looked, the way his eyes were, the way his skin color, his height, his shoes, his clothes, his food, everything. I mean, it's a detailed description of the Messenger of Allah So every household should have that. Read it. It's something you can read on your own. And with the commentary, you can understand. If you have questions, you can ask the teacher. Um, <clears throat> so... So that's one of the, the hadith that's mentioned there, that, Imam, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ had passed away and his, his, uh, he had a um, uh, shield, um, uh, uh, armor that was in, in Rahim. Now, how many Muslims on a day-to-day -day basis deal in that sort of putting up collateral for loans? Is it a regular occurrence? Not really. Maybe if you borrow against your house, um, you know, that might be a modern... Um, equivalent, but it's, it's a rare occurrence. And yet in our chapters of Fiqh, there's detailed rulings of this. And definitely we need a portion of the society to understand those rulings. But what Sheikh Muhammad Mawlou found is that so many people were studying those rules and knowing them, and yet rules that, uh, about the, the, the tongue. Like what are the rules of the tongue, of speaking and interacting with people? Rules of, of how to deal with your parents. Pro, uh, the purification of the heart. Adib of the masjid. So these are all books that he wrote because he would look and he said, okay, there's a gap in knowledge amongst my community. And this is Mauritania, to give you an idea, 
it's split up into different um, categories, but there were certain tribes in Mauritania where everybody memorized the Quran, everybody studied the deen. It was, it was considered a aid, uh, a, um, a shame, if you were a young man and did not memorize the Quran. And I met people that said, you could not even get married to a woman in our tribe if you had not memorized the Quran. I'm like, what kind of man are you if you haven't memorized the Quran? So this, these are people who took pride in, 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 in studying. It wasn't just like, you know, they, were, they happened to be Muslim and a few of them studied. They were all studying, and yet he, he analyzed what they were doing and studying and what they were not. And then he filled in the gaps of knowledge with this curriculum that he laid out. And it's very practical advice, implementable things that occur on a regular day. And as we go through it, um, I hope you also see what what I mean by that in terms of his, his curriculum. So um, this book that I'm going to go through uh, initially, it's called The Rights of Parents, Al-Ghafaru bin Murad fi al bil abai bil ajdad The Rights of Parents. And one of the reasons why it's very important, well, there's a number of reasons, and he, he begins in his book of why it's important. And why is it important for us? Well, we all have parents, and they're either living or they passed away. And we might have children ourselves. So we have a duty to our parents, so we need to know what is actually the proper interaction that a Muslim has with their parents. Our, re our religion is, is not, it, 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 you know, alhamdulillah, one of the things that, that, it, that we're blessed with is that we have details. So if you ask anybody, how did the Prophet ﷺ do wudu? Do we know that? We do, right? How did he pray? Do we know that? Yes. How did he make hajj? Like we have details and all of this has been preserved. How did he buy and sell? How did he get married? How did he hire people? All of those rules are, 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 are preserved. The sharia of the Prophet Muhammad has been preserved. If somebody goes and says, how did Musa do wudu? Because we know that the previous ummas, they did wudu, and they also made prayer. But if, so, if you go to any Jewish man right now, or Jewish woman, you ask them, how did Moses, السلام, how did Musa, السلام, how did he pray? Exactly, I want details, A to Z. Can they do that? It's been lost. They don't even have the original Hebrew that Musa السلام, spoke. The original books, the original Aramaic that Isa السلام, spoke, they don't have access to that. We know exactly how the Messenger of Allah السلام, السلام, recited the Quran, we know exactly where in the mouth the word would come from to pronounce each and every letter. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved this deen. Everything has been preserved. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He has preserved the Qur'an, He's also preserved everything needed to understand the Qur'an. The Qur'an has seerah, stories of the prophets. That's been preserved. The Qur'an has hadith. He mentions what the Prophet وسلم, said in, the, uh, in interactions with the Sahaba. That science has been preserved. The science of Arabic has been preserved. The Qur'an has rules. Don't we have ahkam in the Qur'an? See, Allah says, you can eat this, you can't eat this. This is how you pray, this is how you fast. Well, all of those rules, the details, have all been preserved along with the preservation of the Qur'an. So this is something, alhamdulillah, that we have been honored with, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that we have the, uh, a preservation of, uh, of the Sharia. So now when we come to the subject of respect of the parents, we see it in the Qur'an, we see it in the Hadith, but do we know the details? So we want to turn our understanding of the rights of parents to more of an objective understanding of what that really means as opposed to a subjective understanding. And what I mean by that is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, respect and obey your parents, and if a person doesn't understand the sharia, the rules behind that, could they misunderstand the application? Is it possible that a parent could tell their son or daughter, you have to do this and this and this for me? Because Allah says in the Quran, you have to respect me. But in reality, they're just giving you their own personal opinion of what they think is an obligation upon you. Does that make sense? So we want to turn that subjective understanding into more of an objective understanding. Um, and this is one of the things that Sheikh Muhammad Maulud has done by bringing together all of the ayahs that have been mentioned about Bidul Walidain, respect of the parents, all of the ahadith that have been mentioned about it, the stories of the Sahaba and the understanding of the ulama and the understanding of the scholars. So we'll go through that. So, um, again, he, was, uh, he, uh, he lived about 150 years ago in West African Mauritania. Um, 
And it's important for us to know who we are taking knowledge from. So scholars usually at the beginning of their books or at the end of the books, they'll mention their names. So if you study any traditional book of Islam, you, the, the author will make their introduction. Now, you know, we have book covers and so forth and people put the, the title and the author, the ISBN. We know exactly where those books. But imagine before the printing press, which has only been around about 500 years. So before that, manuscripts and books were very rare and sometimes the pages got um, uh, separated. Sometimes they didn't have covers. And so the author would actually put inside the text, he'll say, and my name is such and such. One of the reasons why is because we cannot take knowledge unless we know its source. So we can't have some random person come into the masjid and just start saying, okay, I'm gonna be the teacher. We actually have to know who the teacher is. And so we look into their background. What I tell people is do a Google search. Actually do a Google search on me. If you've never heard me or you don't know where, find out where I studied. It's not, it, don't look at it as like being bad adab, of being um, um, improper etiquette. It's actually proper etiquette to know where you're taking knowledge from. So if you, you can ask people, what do you know about this person? And it's not considered riba. Um, and let me ask you this. If, if you start asking, say myself, or let's just use Bob. Sheikh Bob comes into the masjid, right? And I like using those names, uh, just as a side note. I used to make up stories when I was teaching kids and I made this character named Timmy. And so Timmy had different you know, adventures and I would try to throw in a moral and so forth. And then one day I mentioned something, I was like, oh yeah, and then Timmy was fasting or praying or went to the mess, and then the kids were like, oh, wait a minute. What do you think they asked? When did Timmy convert? Exactly, they're like, wait a minute, Timmy's a Muslim? Like, yeah, why can't Timmy be a Muslim, right? So you can have maybe any name. I mean, we have people coming from all cultures around the world, and sometimes they have a name that's a Sahaba name or a prophet's name, but sometimes it's a name that's reflective of their own culture, right? So. Sheikh Ba, he walks into the masjid. Now we start asking about him. We start doing Google searches. What would something that some, uh, what could somebody say about our process of a background check of the Sheikh? What would they say like, oh, you shouldn't do that because? Disrespectful. Disrespectful. What else? What else could they say? What could somebody say that says, oh, no, 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 no. He's a Sheikh, he has a turban and a beard and a thobe. Alhamdulillah, we should trust him because we don't want to have as Muslims, we should not have what's something like a what? Bad opinion. Suspicion. Suhul bun, right? Don't have a bad opinion of your brother. How many people have ever, you know, been inquiring about a person, either for a business transaction, maybe looking into, okay, this person came to ask for my sister or my daughter's hand in marriage, and you start asking about them, and they're like, why don't you have a good opinion of your brother? Right? That's because they don't have a, an understanding of what the the uh, the, the suhul ban that we're prohibited from is and in fact Muhammad Maulud in his book on the purification of the heart he explains exactly what is the haram suhul ban what is the permissible suhul ban and what's actually the obligatory suhul ban like when do you not give a person the benefit of the doubt one of the ulama said it's a saying some people um, in their books have attributed it as a hadith in my uh, search I have not found it as a hadith. But the saying is, and it's been accepted from the scholars, and meaning is sound. So again, some attribute it as a hadith. It's not, it's not actually a hadith as far as I have found. But it, what it, what it, say, it says is, beware of people using suspicion. So we've always heard benefit of the doubt. Give your brother the benefit of the doubt. Have you ever heard somebody say, actually, beware? Have you ever heard that discussion? So now in the explanation, Sidi Ahmed Zahru, one of the scholars from Fas who passed away in, in Libya, he said, there's three areas where you do not have a good opinion. You do not start with a good opinion. Your family, your wealth, and your deen, and your religion. So what does that mean? If somebody comes to marry your daughter, do you automatically say, oh, let's have a good opinion of the brother. Do we do that? Or do we do due diligence? And we ask for references and we talk for people. Because that's what a guardian should be. That's what a wali is. If you have somebody in your trust that, you, that Allah has made you the wali uh, uh, of. If somebody comes to, says, hey brother, I got a great business idea. Okay, you're Muslim, alhamdulillah, let's go in. We know how that's going to end, right? 
Do we do that or we do some, we start actually asking people and we start looking in. So, and we can find elements of this in, in the seerah where the Prophet ﷺ would actually talk about people. Umar one time he heard somebody praising another man. He said, have you traveled with him? No. Have you done business with him? No. Then you don't know him. So don't praise him. Because that's when the true nature, anybody has done business with people and whoa, that's not, you're not the same person, you know, before we got in the money. Money really brings out the true nature of people. And travel does the same thing too. In Arabic, the word for travel is what? Sefar. Sefara means to become a parent. So in the Fajr, when the dawn comes in, when the dawn first comes in, that's Fajr. And then when it becomes enough light to where you can see the faces of people, that's called Isfar, same, from the same root word. So Safara, you travel with people, you get them out of their normal routines, because sometimes routines can hide the true nature of ourselves or other people, and then we, 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 we can see the, the true nature of people. So we can get to when Suhulban and Husnulban is, is, is appropriate, but um, these are, this is where we want to turn our understanding of the deen, deen from being subjective to being objective, like we know it's clear. When we do wudu, do we go in there and we're like, I think this is where you wash to. Or when we pray, I think this is the way we pray. What would happen after 1400, we just got into our new year, right? Muharram. What would 1440, 1440 after hijrah, 1440 years, if every generation says, I think, hmm, what would happen by now? It would have been God. So the subjective element has been removed in the transmission of this deen, and it's objective, we turn. So this is one of the things Muhammad Maulud is doing, and he's bringing back the tafsir of the Qur'an, the hadith, and it's a lot of one of the, the hallmarks of his books, is it's things that everybody accepts. It's not necessarily school of thought, madhab specific. So he begins his book by, he says, He says, praise be to Allah, the one who has joined between Iman and respect of the parents in the Quran. <coughs> so think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has joined between Iman and the respect of the parents. So now think of some of the ayahs, if you've uh, memorized those. There's one in Surah Al-Isra, um, 1723. That's actually one of the, the hallmark ayahs. If you don't memorize, if you're not planning on memorizing entire surahs, 1723 to 25, that right there, you should memorize it. You can actually do the whole lesson of Bidr one again off of that. It's good to, to, to remind ourselves. Memorize it, understand it. 1723. But what is the order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? When he, when he, you'll see. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And there's a number of ayahs that mention, like the order, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it just in the Quran, He did it just in the list of lessons and just mention randomly, oh, and be good to your parents. If you look at uh, how he has actually presented the order to respect your parents, it's directly associated with the order to believe in the oneness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And there, we have to, we have to be, we have to be, uh, uh, we have to look at the subtleties of the Quran, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is placing this ayah, and what's he placing around the ayah. So he's saying. Um, in one of the ayahs it says that one of the, the ordainments that Allah has placed on Bani Israel is that they do not associate partners with Allah and that they are good to their parents. In Surah Al-Isra it says Allah has ordained that you worship none other than Him and be good to your parents. <coughs> so this now starts us off with, this is not a simple order, is it? It's not, it's not even the order to, to, to pray. It's not believe in the oneness of Allah. Well, actually that one I have to say, yeah, because it says the description of the believers, usually it's belief and then prayer. And then what's the next one? Usually after prayer. Zakat. Ibn Abbas, he said there's actually three orders in the Quran that are what could be, um, they're like dual orders. They're mentioned as pairs. One is Salat and Zakat. The other is uh, Iman and respect to the parents. And the third is, it's slipping my mind, I'll have to look it up. There's a third one. <clears throat> Remind me next week. Salih. What's that? Salih. Hmm? Salih. Amal Salih. It, uh, that's a more general order of righteous actions, but there's something where it's a specific, there's a, there's a third one, I'll, I'll look it up. It's so much Salah. It's a, it's a, uh, 
Somebody was salah, but it, it's multiple times. So it's like, you usually see iqamah to salah and zakah. So Ibn Abbas said these three orders, because they're, they're coming in orders, to fulfill the order, you have to do both. So you haven't fulfilled that order until you've done both. So if, we, if Allah says, believe in Allah, do not associate partners with Allah and be good with your parents, we, can't, we have to do both together. Now, it doesn't mean that if a person is bad with their parents, they're a kafir. Uh, that's not what it means. But the fulfillment, the complete fulfillment of that order, you have to do both. Same thing with salah and zakat. The other thing about the salah and zakat being together, usually when people like list out their Islam, it's usually like, yeah, I pray five times a day and I fast Ramadan. Ramadan is after zakat. And what did Abu Bakr anhu, when the tribes after the passing of the Prophet وسلم, a lot of the tribes of the Hijaz of the Arabian Peninsula, in fact, most of the tribes left Islam. And except for four areas, Mecca, Medina, Tarim, and Hadramaut area of Yemen, and Ahsa in eastern Saudi Arabia. Anybody ever heard of Ahsa? Al Ahsa? Yeah. Ahsa. That was one area where they, from the time they became Muslim, with the da'wah of the Sahaba and the Prophet actually went to Ahsa, and according to one narration, they've been Muslim since. And that one place in the Hadramaut Valley in Yemen and Mecca and Medina. Everywhere else, the tribes are like, oh, we made our allegiance to Muhammad, and he's gone. So we don't have to, and then they, they had to be taught a lesson. No, your allegiance is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Abu Bakr, who he sent out armies. And what did Umar tell him? He said, you know, they're new to Islam. Uh, you know, they're still praying. Because that was their refusal. They didn't actually leave Islam. They just said, we'll be Muslim, we'll pray. Zakat is not an obligation upon us. That's all they did. They didn't leave Islam. They just said, we're not going to uh, pay our zakat. And what did Abu Bakr say? He said, I will not distinguish between an order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not distinguish between. He said, salah and zakat. That's how important it is. So, Muhammad Mawdur begins his text by saying, I praise Allah who has joined between Iman and Bir. Now, if we look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu he asked the Sahaba a question. He said, Should I not tell you about the worst of the kabair? And I've already kind of given a spoiler, but usually when I ask children this, or even adults in, a, in, in an audience, I say, what is the worst sin a person can do? What are the answers going to be? Shirk, uh, associated part. That's the number one. Every, okay, we get that one. What's the next one? What's that? Hmm? There's so many. Sins. There's so many. But what's the worst? Because he told he told the Sahaba. He said, "Should I not tell you about the worst of sins?" And the first one, Zakhlaw Khair, brother, was uh, shit. He said, "Al Ishaaku Billah," doing shit. But what's the next one? Some murder is usually one we get. What's that? Lying. That's what's that? Bad to your parents. Yeah, I gave the spoiler, right? <laughs> so I kind of like, I, I set that one up a little bit improperly. But yeah. And the disrespect of parents. So you see the order in the, uh, the Quran says, believe in Allah and respect your parents. Well, what's the opposite of belief in Allah? Shirk and kufr. So he's saying, here's the worst thing. And what's the opposite of respecting your parents? Disrespect of the parents. So here the Prophet is setting up for us with like almost a scale. Over here you have Iman, and right after you have Bidr al and then at the other, uh, respect of the parents, at the other end you have the far end, you have Shirk, and then you have disrespect of parents. Now one thing that's interesting in the Hadith literature is that in a number of different instances, people would come to the Prophet and they would ask him a question. They would say, what is the best action I can do? <laughs> Has anybody ever seen some of these Hadith? So what did he say one time? What are, what are some of the answers? What is the best action? Respecting What's that? Respecting, mother. Respecting your mother. What's another hadith? Even if you don't remember the exact hadith, but the idea, like I vaguely remember, you know, the best action. Take care of the orphans. Taking care of the orphans. What else? There's a hadith, another hadith that says prayer. The best thing after saying La ilaha illallah is prayer. In another hadith it says the best thing after La ilaha illallah is jihad and fi sabilillah. In another hadith that says, you know, in sadaqah, giving charity. Now all of these sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, they're attributed to him. Is he contradicting himself? So this is something, this is where the, um, our scholars 
are the, 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 the interpreters of the Sunnah. Some, some people have an understanding, they say, why can't I just open up the Qur'an and read it? Why can't I just open up the Hadith? Well, here, I'll give you an issue. I can give you multiple Sahih Hadith where it says, the best action is prayer. The best action is rights of the parents. The best action is Sadaqah. The best action is this. We give you five or six Hadith that says the best, the best, the best. Well, Ahsan in Arabic means the best. The best. Explain that one to me. I can't figure it out. Well, let's see what the scholars did that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, given, given uh, you know, they, they have taught, um, they have learned, and they have, they're able to uh, interpret. And we see the Sahaba, the, the, there was only a few amongst the Sahaba who had a very high level of, of knowledge. It was about 20 or so. So you see examples of the Sahaba where if they had a problem, who would they go to? Who are some of the Sahaba that they would go to? To, to um, solve issues or to answer questions. Abu Bakr was one, who else? Ali radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu actually he said, he said, A'udhu billah, he said, I seek refuge in Allah from a situation, a qadiyya, that we don't have Ali to help us solve. Dina, sorry, the, the, if, if the Prophet sallallahu was a city of knowledge, who is the door? Ali radiallahu anhu. In fact, he was so, so, um, not only was he a warrior on the battlefield, not only was he gentle with his family, and not only was he a scholar, he was, I mean, uh, beyond a genius. There's a, a, a matter in inheritance, in the rules of inheritance. The matter of the inheritance is actually called al-minbariyya. The minbar mas'ala. Ali radiallahu anhu was standing on the minbar, giving a khutbah. He's in the middle of the khutbah. Somebody outside of the masjid comes up with an inheritance scenario that has never uh, come out. You know, usually it's like one eighth, one fourth, one third. Those are the common denominator. So you have to kind of find you have to find a common denominator. There's a little bit of algebra behind the rules of inheritance. It's actually very, very fun to learn. For those of you who have studied algebra, to learn the rules of inheritance, you're like, oh, it makes sense. Um, but sometimes when you have, depending on the family members. You might have to get to a big common denominator. You have to go to 30, you know, 30 parts or 50 parts. Well, there was a situation where it actually had to go to 600 parts. Like that was the common denominator, like five out of 600. But the person presented this situation to Ali. As he's giving the khutbah, he processes that mathematical equation, gives the answer in his khutbah, rhyming with the rest of his khutbah. Wasara thumunuha sudusa, and her eighth has now become a sixth. It's called the minbari. That's Ali radiallahu anha. So these, and then of course Aisha radiallahu anha. The Sahaba would go to her, not only because she was a, a scholar in her own right, in addition to being a scholar, she was living with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so she, she was right there. Um, so, um, so we go to our scholars. So now we have these multiple ahadith. What, which one is correct? Well, they're all correct. The best of actions is prayer. The best of actions is sadaqah. The best of actions. So the scholar said, the Prophet ﷺ does not contradict himself. Because that would be a sign that this is not revelation. What does the Quran say to us? That if this book was from other than Allah, what would they have found in it? Contradictions. Much contradictions. So we know the book, the Quran has no contradictions. One of the things that the, 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 the people who attack Islam will say, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one time says that the, the day, uh, the day according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khamsina al fasana, 50,000 years. And another hadith, in another ayah it says what? That the yom is what? It's like a thousand years, 1,000. So, oh, here's a clear contradiction. No, it's not. Because the Quran was revealed in the language of the Arabs. And the Arabs used to use mubalagha, used to use figures of speech to describe a very long day. If you really want to describe, like, I've been waiting here forever. I've been waiting here for... I've been here for 50,000 years, man. So if you say as Mubarak, it's not literal. It's like, I've been here for a thousand years. Wait, I've been, you know, I've been waiting for you for a thousand hours. Or what would we say now? You know, I've been here, you know, like... I've been here, you use a Mubarak. What's that? Forever. I've been here forever. So you're not literally saying that. It's a Mubarak. So there, is there a contradiction between 50,000 or a thousand? No, it just means... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to the Arabs in the Arabic language and he's saying that day, Yom al Qiyamah, is going to be very long. Oh, well, how long? No, 50,000 years. And another ayah says 1,000 years. al -fasan. So what the Arabs immediately understood is like, it's not 50,000 years and it's not 1,000 years. It's just a very long day. So there's no contradiction. 
So based on this, the, uh, the, 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 the people of Tafsir have said that one of the signs of falsehood is that it contradicts itself. And the sign of truth, that it does not contradict itself. So you'll find that in, if you see whatever it might be, if you find a teacher, if you find a book, if you find a person, they're always contradicting your, themselves. You're like, okay, this person's got some falsehood wrapped up in, or they're wrapped up in falsehood. The same thing that we apply to the Qur'an, in that it's revelation from Allah, and there's no contradiction, is the same thing we apply to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because in huwa, illa wahyun duha. He is revelation being revealed to. Everything he speaks is revelation. So if he told us these various ahadith, and they're in different, uh, we can say, okay, there's no contradiction here, but we need to have an understanding. Why did he tell different people at different times that the best action is prayer, is right to the parents, is charity, is this, is that. Why? Why? why could, what could be an answer? Because it tailors to individuals. Jazakallah. What's your name, brother? Rami. Ra My name's Rami too. <laughs> MashaAllah. Must be something in the name. Jazakallah khair, Rami. It's tailored to the individual. So when that person came and, the, and he said, what is the best of actions? And he told them right to the parents. What was that person struggling with? He could see what he was struggling with. When the person, maybe the miser came and said, what's the best of actions? Salaqah. Another person who was a coward, what's the best of action? Jihad. What's the best of action? And he's tailoring. So they said the Prophet is a doctor of the souls, is a doctor of the hearts. And he's seeing what a person needs and giving them or her that, uh, that information. So this is why it's very important, especially when you read the seerah, to realize there are multiple people and there's multiple personalities and that's what's going to be reflected in our community. When you think of the character of Umar, and by character I mean he was a real live person. You know, we don't believe in some metaphor. Like some, some Christians will actually explain away stories in the Bible by saying, oh, these are just metaphors and parables. And unfortunately, some Muslims have fallen into that trap. They'll say, oh, especially in our day and age, they'll say, oh, the story of oh, Luke, the people of Luke, the Sodom and Gomorrah, that's just a metaphor. It didn't actually happen. No, no, it actually happened. We believe there was a city people of Lul, they were sent a messenger, they were doing something wrong, and they were destroyed for it. End of story. It happened. According to some scholars, it's actually under the Dead Sea right now. That's what some scholars say. Um, um, and as a side note to that, the scholars, <clears throat> the Prophet said, whenever he was traveling with his companions, if they passed through a place where it was a destroyed nation, he would tell them, hurry up and go through. Stay long enough just to get a reflection of what happened here, but move through and don't use their water and don't use their sand. Um, so one time they were going through the people of Thamud, you know, the, the, the people who used to carve their homes out of the, the stones. They passed through and they mentioned that some of the Sahaba had made bread with some of the wells from the people of Thamud and the Prophet said, give it to the animals, don't eat that. So the understanding, some ulama said, oh, some say it's prohibited to use the water and the, the land. Some say it's makru, it's dislike, but the point is don't use that. So the reason I mention that is if you ever get uh, an opportunity to buy Dead Sea salts, pass on the opportunity. Even though all oh, the mud is great and wonderful for your skin. And I'm from Jordan and it's a big export thing. They, get, they export the mud and the salts and all that stuff. Just pass on it. Just say, if that is like what's covering up the people of Lul, it's like the rim, it's like imagine like a toxic area or a nuclear waste zone. That, that, that land is radioactive and you don't want to go around it. The scholars even differed. They said if you do wudu from the, from the wells of Thamud, is your wudu valid? If you do tayammum on the land of a parish nation, is your tayammum valid? Like, we got to stay away from that. So, um, so the Prophet Sallallahu would treat people uh, depending on what they were dealing with. So, each of us has a certain level of an area that we need to improve with our in interaction with our parents. So this is what we should rem remind ourselves. When we see ourselves deficient, we, we think of these ahadith. So Muhammad Mulu begins by saying, praise be to Allah who is joined between Iman and the, the order to bear walidain. The Prophet wasallam said that the worst of actions is shirk and then uqub al-walidain. So now that sets up uh, what uh, who, um, how his text uh, is, is going into. Now another thing 
that Muhammad Maudud mentions, he says, after he mentions this, he says, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised na'een to the abrar. Think of the ayah that has those two words, na'een and abrar. Everybody, and most people should. Inna al-abrara la fi na'een. And then what's the next? Wa inna al-fujara la fi jahin. It's the end of the story. The righteous ones are in Jannah, and the unrighteous ones are in Jah Jahim. There was one of the righteous, uh, the righteous men in, in Mauritania, and people, they, 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 their, their greeting is Ishtari. It's kind of like, you know, Shufo, what's up? You know, Ishtari. It literally means Ishtara, you know, what's up? You know, people always like, Ishtari. So, so when they would ask him, Ishtari, what's new? He would say, nothing's new. The righteous are in Jannah and the unrighteous are in Hellfire. End of story. Like no matter what happens, no matter what news, no matter who gets elected, no matter what government, at the end of the day, what's the what's the, the, the closing line of the story? The righteous are in Jannah and the unrighteous are in Jannah. That's that's it. Now the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for the righteous, he doesn't say as-salihun, he says al-abrar. Those people who do bid. Now, Muhammad Maulud is mentioning this because this subject is birrul walidain, righteousness towards the people, towards the parents. So, those who do bid, the plural would be abrad. Now, the general sense of abrad is any type of action that you can do is, is, is bid. If you do those actions, then you become abrad, uh, uh, from the abrad. But it doesn't matter what you do. Like you could do everything else, sadaqa, salah, so If you don't have respect of your parents, you don't get included in the abrar category. Does that make sense? Because to be in the abrar, you have to have bit towards the parents. I'll tell you an interesting story, and this shows um, how when we interact with the Quran, when we read the Quran, it should be a personal relationship. And when I ask the question, if you feel comfortable sharing it, have you ever read something in the Quran, and as you're reading it, like something happens directly related to what you're reading or to a thought that you're having? Has anybody ever had that? Yes. Anybody want to share something that might ha have happened? I'll start. One time I was thinking about giving somebody a, a, a gift and I was like, ah, uh, you know, I don't know, should I really give it? It's kind of mine and I don't really... And then I was reading an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what Allah, whatever, uh, the, the, I can't remember the exact ayah, but it was about generosity. Give and Allah will, repre will replace it. I was like, okay, there's my answer. Anybody have a, a, an experience? There's a video on YouTube. Oh, I can't, I'll, I'll post it on the WhatsApp group. And if you're not on the WhatsApp group for this halaqa, how do we say we're going to add people to it? There's a link? Okay, so some of you, who has the link to the WhatsApp group? Just raise your hand. Okay, we'll have to send it out afterwards. If you want to just... Of a, of a man who was, uh, in fact, I won't give you the spoil. I, I won't spoil it for you. It's better just to watch it in his own words. It's a man who was um, searching for Islam, and he asked a question, and the answer was in the Quran. And so he tells that story himself. I won't. Uh, I'll let you tell it uh, or hear it. But I was with a group of people one time. We were in Mauritania, and we were in a car, and we were passing by this small little village. Not even a village, just a, a group of tents. And they had named their group of tents Dar and Naim, the abode of blessing. Dar and Naim. So as we passed it, we, you know, and I'm familiar with the area. So the brother who was who was with me, he was visiting. He's from New York, originally from Palestine. He said, "Rami, what did that sign say?" I said, "Oh, it's a little collection village of, of tents. It's called Dar and Naim." He said, "Subhanallah, I was I he said I was reciting my surahs that I had memorized. I had just said." And then we pass that, that sign. Well, is that coincident? Can statistically, like what's, what are, what are the, the, the chances of that happening? Like as soon as he recited that ayah, the righteous are in Na'im. And then we pass by a place that says Dar Na'im. And it's almost like a, a, a sign. It's called a Fal Hasan. A good sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to that person. And this is something the Prophet sallallahu used to actually look for. He would look for Fal Hasan. Good signs. He told us not to believe in bad omens, you know, the black cat and the, the, the uh, mirror breaks and uh, in, in the south, they have, my mom's from Mississippi, so they have some of these things they still, they said if you knock over the salt shaker, you have to take some salt and throw it over your shoulder. Anybody ever heard of that? 
Yeah? Who's, yeah. So they, they, they got interesting things that people come up with, and I'm sure every culture has something. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, we don't believe in those things. Uh, in fact, we should do the opposite of them. Like, if we're like, oh, uh, you know, see a black cat, oh, it's going to be a good day, you know. Uh, walk under a ladder. If you see a ladder, walk under the ladder, you know. <laughs> Buy a mirror and break it just for, you know, <laughs> just to do it. Um, so, um, so Muhammad Maudud says that the, the, the abrar are in na'im, and now he's going to begin going through the, the, the various rules of Bidr al And he's going to break it up by, he's saying, he says, I'm going to show you how to respect your parents and have proper respect of your parents with each of your limbs, with your eyes, with your tongue, with your ears, with your hands, with your heart, and with your feet. All of, uh, all of the different ways that we could respect or disrespect the parents. So we'll be going through this over the next uh, coming weeks. And again, um, this halab is usually from about eight to nine. Um, and um, it's some of the material that I'm going to be sharing with the, the young men and the boys in, in their halab. Um, but right now, I'll just open up to any questions for anything that I um, discussed tonight. Yes, Anwar? Uh, you mentioned the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea. What do we do about uh, living here in the United States and all the bullying that's been going on? All the what? All the injustice that we are living on. We're living on land that's been usurped. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so the question was, what do we do um, about living here in America from the land that's been usurped? You know, it's a lot of stolen land. They made treaties with the Native Americans and they took them. What do you do? And it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a problem. And it's not something that we should think, oh, it's not a big deal. Uh, Imam al Nawawi, who's from originally from where? Nina. What's that? Nina. Nina. Imam al Nawawi, yeah, uh, in, in, in modern day Syria. Syria. Um, I don't think he's from, no, he's from Noah. Nineveh, Nineveh is in Iraq. Noah is, is an area in, in Syria. But he's buried in Damascus. And uh, it's funny, this shows you like um, in translations, one time there was a shift uh, giving, uh, and this is, it sounds like a joke, but. Um, he was, um, my voice, the, the young brothers are giving khutbah in there. So I don't want to tell the children they're praying. So the Imam said, can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. So the Imam said, um, he, he, or the Sheikh said something about Al Imam al Nawawi. Imam Nawawi. The translator said, the nuclear Imam. <laughs> <laughs> because nuclear in Arabic, the modern translation is, a, you know, like a. a, 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 a or so he said the, the nuclear imam. So just kind of, sometimes things are lost in translation. Or one time there was a person, he said, which, what does that mean in Arabic? Hmm? Under, under very harsh circumstances. I'm under very harsh circumstances. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a new expression. So modern standard Arabic, they've kind of like taken uh, things from other languages, Italian, French, and said, okay, how do we express this idea that's in English? In, in, in English, like how do you translate infrastructure, right? It's a very powerful English word. How do you translate that into Arabic? So, um, somebody translated it, he's under Cairo envelopes. Because <laughs> Buruf is also envelopes, and Tahira is the city of... So sometimes things get lost in translation. Um, so, um, so Imam al Nawawi lived in Damascus. He would not eat any of the fruits from Damascus. And the reason why <clears throat> was because one of the things, Damascus was taken, who, who, who opened Damascus? Like when did we, the Muslim Ummah, get Damascus? The Sahaba, right? Khalid ibn Walid is buried there. It's a big, like, it's a momentous occasion for us as Muslims. They got Damascus, it was one of the, 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 the centers of, uh, of the civilized world. In fact, when the French came in and conquered uh, uh, Syria, you know what one of the French generals did? He went to the grave of Khalid bin Walid and put his boot on the grave of Khalid bin Walid. He said, now we got it back. Because they know his, him, uh, Khalid, as an as, as a, as a expert general. But if Khalid was alive, you think he would be putting his boot? <laughs> He'd go home one-legged, you know, if he was lucky. Um, but those lands were taken by the, the Sahaba. And one of the things when the, when, the, when, the, when, when the Muslims, when they took over lands, there were certain things that were distributed amongst the soldiers. It's called Ghanima. But it, was not, it did not apply to buildings or uh, agricultural land. So what does that mean? When they went into Egypt, anything that was agricultural, or when they, they went into Syria, or, that became Oqaf. 
that actually goes to Bayt al Mal. And so they said the majority of Damascus was actually Awqaf. That by the time of Imam al-Nawi, who was about 700 years ago, it had kind of like fallen into the hands of, uh, of, of, of private ownership. But a waqf, an endowment, can never go into private ownership. Once you put something into waqf, what does waqf mean in Arabic? Stops. That's it. No more transfer of wealth. And so this is something from the Sharia of the Prophet ﷺ. He encouraged awqaf, sadaqa jariyah, and, and, and people would do it. Those lands were supposed to be awqaf. So Baghdad. Damas Damascus, uh, um, Qahira, you know, those, those lands, all of the, the agricultural lands and everything was supposed to be Awqaf to support the Bayt al -Mal. To give you an idea of the power of Awqaf and how it can be changed, I, I spoke with a person who, 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 who did research into the Awqaf. One of the most, um, the biggest agricultural areas of the Middle East or North Africa is, is Algeria. Anybody here from Algeria? You're from, you know what Algeria produces, right? The Minister of Agriculture actually studied in Davis. Why do you think he would study in Davis? Davis is a big ag university, right? So he, uh, and I know, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I met his son too. They had sent him to, um, to Napa to study the wine industry. <laughs> because Algeria also na now produces wine, they have grapes. He said, at the turn of the century, two thirds of the agricultural land of Algeria was endowments. Two thirds. Could you imagine the, 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 the revenue that that would produce? Two-thirds of the lands of, 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 uh, of, uh, of Algeria. A great amount of, of lands of, uh, of, of Egypt was Awqaf uh, and, and every land. One of the things that the colonizers did is they shifted the Awqaf from the hands of the, 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 the free citizens to the governments. So you know how every one of our nations, whether it's Arab or, or, or subcontinent or Malaysia or Indonesia, have Ministry of Endowments? You know where we got that? The colonizers. Because they wanted to take the, 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 in, in, the, 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 the Awqaf and shift it into the hands of the government. Now think of what would happen if the private citizens were managing those Awqaf and giving salaries to schools, to universities, building roads, building bridges, orphanages. What would happen in terms of the freedom of thought, especially of the scholars? Now you shift that to the government, then what happens? So we could go into, into this. I actually know another brother who, he came to Islam, he was a, he was a very successful, I think they're done praying back there, um, he, was a, he was a very successful Swiss banker. And for two years he searched, he said, I want to become Muslim, but I'm a Swiss banker. So what is he involved in? Riba. And he said, I want to be uh, an honest Muslim. So I'm either going to become Muslim and deal in Riba, but I want to see, is there a way out for me? He said he spent two years just on the matter of riba as a very successful Swiss banker. He looked at everything. He, he looked at fatawa, he looked at books, he looked at the end of two years, he came across away from the conclusion, he said, there's no way out for me. If I want to be true and honest with myself. So he left all of that. He became Muslim. He's actually in Malaysia right now. And he said, I'm going to use my banking and investment knowledge to revive privately run Oqaf. Now he has an investment for that. I'll share his company with you on the, the, if you're interested. He has, he does privately managed cash Awqaf in Malaysia and Indonesia, and he also does investments. Um, but he also said, he told me this thing about one of the main um, purposes of the, coloni uh, of the colonizers was to shift privately managed Awqaf to the hands of the government. Because then two things happen. It gets eaten up, right? Oh, this person's cousin, this person, you know, he shifts out of, uh, of the place and it gets eaten up. And the other thing is then now, if the government is giving the salary of the scholars, do the scholars really have the freedom to speak up? Hmm? They don't. But if, they, if, if their salary was not coming from the government, the Ministry of Endowments, like, I don't care what you say. I'm going to speak the truth because I'm getting my salary from a privately managed wealth. So the reason I went on that uh, political tirade uh, was that at the time of Imam al-Nawi, most of Damascus, which used to be endowments, had transferred into private ownership. So at some point, those Oqaf were sold illegally to private citizens. And so he did not eat any of the fruits of Damascus. Now, could somebody come and say it was haram to eat the fruits? We can't say that. Like, unless we know for sure, if we know for sure that this house was stolen, or this masjid was stolen, we can't pray. But we have to be sure, 100% sure, or almost sure that this house was stolen or this land was stolen. If we don't know, it's a shubha, it's a doubtful matter. And what did the Prophet teach us about doubtful matters? 
better to stay away from them, but do we have to? Do we have to stay away from doubtful matters? No, it's not haram. But the more we stay away from the doubtful matters, the better our deen will be. So we don't know for sure that it has been. If we know for sure that it's been stolen, then we can't, uh, then we can't live on that or, or benefit. But if, we, if we're unsure, then it's a shubha or less than that. We also got to keep in mind, like, when the Prophet was passing through those cities, they were just passing through. So they can avoid water for a little bit, you know what I mean? I don't know if they were living there. Oh, like the people of Thamud? Yeah, yeah. So, like, for yeah. example, they were passing through. You know, we can avoid it, they avoid it, you know, so like if we're passing through America, we can avoid it, fine. Yeah, you, and that's a good question, a good point, that, that in the, 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 sex, the situations of Thamud, they were just passing through it, just a short trip, they weren't living in it. The other distinction that I would make is that those, those places, like to know that a place is actually a parish nation, it has to come through revelation. So the Diyad Thamud, we know for a fact, that's the, those are the houses of Thamud, because the Prophet ﷺ told us that. But he never told us about the Dead Sea. So that's why the scholars actually differed. Is the Dead Sea the remnants of those people or not? We don't know. So in America, could there be have been a parish nation? Maybe. But we don't we need revelation to designate for us what is actually a, 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 a Ard of Adal. Does that make sense? I know it's nine o'clock and some of you are parents to time for pickup. Inshallah we'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue this next week.